Ya. Okay, so guys, follow us on streaming. That's the first thing I have to remember, otherwise I'll forget. Hi to everyone uh, following us live. And uh, the, the tags for Twitter are uh, CP Millennial and CPCR, okay? And uh, hi, and whatever questions uh, you guys have today or the rest of the sessions, please feel free to, to ask things on Twitter to make this uh, more interactive and break uh, the walls of, uh, of this room. So uh, I um, have the honor to introduce Waila Abbas. Some people uh, feel overwhelmed to meet uh, the princess who honored us with their visit today. Um, I feel overwhelmed to, to meet him and, and introduce him. I, I met him in Tunis last week. To have the honor to introduce such an outstanding fighter for freedom and uh, for justice. I think justice is the concept. I think it's a more powerful word and more powerful concept than peace, which is a beautiful term, but it's used and abused by the institutions. And uh, repressive regimes are very, very scared of the concept justice, which is uh, what uh, Wael and uh, other activists online and offline are, uh, are working uh, for in the, in the Middle East and North Africa region and uh, beyond. So uh, Wael has been working uh, using technology for years to expose police brutality in Egypt, which shows that the revolutions did not happen overnight. There's been uh, activists online and offline working for years to, to make these changes possible, not only to expose what the authorities did and how they terrorized their population in this context, but they're also bloggers in particular in Egypt are performing a very important role voicing the concerns and the demands and the needs of other sectors of Egyptian society who do not have a voice that people can listen to, like uh, the trade unions or like uh, teachers who demand uh, a decent minimum salary in the country decent uh, working conditions. So bloggers are becoming, in a way, uh, spoke persons for other parts of the, uh, for parts, for different parts of uh, civil society in Egypt and making these concerns be heard locally and also worldwide. And uh, we are at a very long process now. It's uh, very exciting, it's very scary at the same time. In Egypt, in uh, Syria, in Bahrain, all over the region, we are, we are going to be dealing with very complex processes that we should all be aware of. Let's not leave these guys alone. Let's stay tuned of what people like Wael, of what it's never been easier to follow the voices of citizens from within. So let's stay tuned on bloggers in all this country, all over the world. And um, it affects us, it concerns us, and uh, it has to do with uh, all of us as citizens uh, involved in freedom and justice for, for everyone. So once this said, uh, just like, let you meet the wonderful blogger Wael Abbas. Thank you. Oh, okay. I have one already. Can you hear me, guys? I guess, yeah. Good evening. Uh, glad to be here among you. Um, I originally um, uh, had uh, prepared a speech, uh, but when I came here and I found all these uh, gadgets and dinosaurs and robots, and uh, I, I got really impressed, so I decided not to be boring. So uh, instead, I decided to uh, take you on a journey by video. Uh, of uh, the activism on the internet since early 2004 until the revolution. Um, as bloggers, uh, we um, uh, were not um, satisfied with the traditional media covering what's going on, going on in Egypt. It was the coverage was mainly one-sided and uh, they always tend to avoid clashing with the regime and they always fe feared for their equipment, their cameras and the safety of their crews. So there was a lot of 
stuff happening in Egypt, especially during 2004 and 2005, that were not getting enough media coverage uh, or getting any at all. Uh, so some of the bloggers decided to take their digital cameras or mobile phones and go to these uh, demonstrations and sit-ins and strikes and take pictures and photos and uh, interview some of the people there to convey the message to the people who are not getting it through the traditional media. Uh, this is an example of some of these uh, activities that were covered by the bloggers. This is a demonstration, uh, I think it was against the war in uh, Lebanon in 2006. It took place in Al-Azhar uh, Mosque and uh, the police here was wearing plain clothes and it was clashing with the protester as if it's the protesters clas clashing with each other. This is part of the uh, demonstrations uh, during the judges' club crisis, when the judges uh, were staging a sit-in, uh, demanding independence uh, from the government. And uh, there was a lot of support for, uh, for them from the political movements and parties and the activists and the bloggers too. This is an example of some of the demonstrations that were not covered by the traditional media. This, this is one of the early demonstrations of Kifaya, in which you can see uh, an activist being severely beaten. Kifaya is the Egyptian movement calling for change in Egypt that was formed late 2004 uh, and calling for Mubarak to step down and for guarantees that his son is not going to follow him. An example also of the stories that bloggers covered were workers sit in. These are garbage collectors uh, in Giza uh, who were on a strike because they had demands about their salaries and their management. We did not only cover the uh, protests and the sit-ins, but we also tried to go deep and show the people uh, how those workers are living and uh, the daily suffering uh, in their life. This is an example from uh, Mahalla, it's uh, uh, a textile industry um, city in the Nile Delta in Egypt. And their workers were on a strike back then uh, when I interviewed this uh, worker and he took me to his place to show me his, his living conditions. Um, because the, the traditional media was not trustworthy, the bloggers were the only uh, trustworthy people to cover some surprise uh, demonstrations uh, by some of the uh, uh, political uh, uh, movements. This movement, this uh, demonstration took place in Shobra in 2005 by the Youth for Change movement. Uh, it was uh, uh, part of the Kifaya movement, but it was mainly for youth. And they decided to stage a surprise demonstration so that the security will not crack down on it. It's like something like a flash mob where people come and demonstrate and ask people to join them and uh, spread papers and leaflets and then disappear without a trace. And the bloggers were the only ones trusted to cover these uh, kind of demonstrations. Egyptian bloggers only also were not uh, 
uh, restricted uh, in, in coverage to uh, covering Egyptian issues. This is, for example, a video of the uh, Palestinians who were trapped in uh, Sinai uh, while the borders were closed by the uh, Egyptian authorities. This guy has a problem with his eye and he came for treatment uh, in Egypt but he did not receive any and he's now trapped, he cannot enter Egypt and he cannot go back to Rafa. We did some coverage also outside the Egyptian borders. This was a coverage of the situation in Gaza uh, during the time when the, order, the borders were, were open. They were crossing the border to uh, buy necessary uh, uh, supplies which were not available because of the uh, uh, blockade. So they crossed the border to Egypt to buy this stuff. We also covered the uh, American election, the Obama-McCain one. This guy is a Mexican, he was standing outside one of the uh, polling stations in Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia, the United States, and he was singing happily, uh, advocating for Obama. Uh, he told me later that uh, when Obama won, he felt that he, he's, he's originally a Mexican immigrant. Uh, that he had hope for his children that one of them can be president in the future since Obama, who's a black guy, descendant of immigrants, has become the president of the United States. I think you understand Spanish, most of you. I don't, unfortunately. I wish I did. The bloggers in Egypt were not only covering what was going on, but they also um, had their own uh, events and had their own campaigns and had their own activities on the street, not only on the internet. As I always say, the bloggers in Egypt are different because they have one foot on the internet and one foot in the street. So this is a demonstration in the Shobra district, 2006. It was calling for national unity between Muslims and Christians. This took place in uh, April 20, 2006. As you can see uh, how the bloggers were able to get all these numbers of people to take to the street and demonstrate for this noble cause of national unity. This might be a surprise to you, but the first sit-in in Tahrir was not 2011. It was 2006, and it was entirely organized by the bloggers. It was on the 16th and the 17th of March, 2006. As you can see, they are preparing the, uh, the square for us by uh, spraying water on the grass so we cannot 
sit or uh, or uh, gather. We had the same demands for change, independence of justice. end of torture, end of Mubarak's regime. The military police was there, but they were so peaceful back then, unlike they are now at the moment. We had graffiti on the asphalt saying down was Mubarak. And we spent the night there, actually. They cut off the light, of course, and they kept us in the dark. And the, uh, the older um, politicians were totally against this sit-in. But when they found that it was successful, they came and they joined. It was winter, it was very cold, and we were sleeping on wet uh, ground. The media got really interested in what we are doing and they started asking our permission to air uh, our footage. The amateur photographer is yours truly. This is um, the um, judges club sit in. This is the parallel one organized by the bloggers. They were uh, staging a sit in outside the judges club in solidarity with the judges and the police uh, attacked it severely and arrested everybody that was there and most of them spent like two months in jail and some of them were sexually assaulted while in prison. This is another example of how the media sometimes steal our material. This is a video that I've shown you earlier. Al Jazeera has used this video uh, in one of their promos, but this is not the video of the promo, unfortunately. I got the link wrong, I'm sorry. After we have posted all this kind of material that you have seen, people started sending us their own. And what people sent us was completely different than what we got. For example, we got train crashes, which is also a result of uh, the corruption in Egypt. So these are first-hand eyewitnesses who witness the incident themselves and they take footage with their phones and they send it to the bloggers because they have more reach. So this is, in my opinion, is the real citizen journalism. and footage of sexual harassment, which is a big problem in Egypt at the moment. and footage of election rigging that otherwise we could have never had access to. Look at the guy in the window. He has already all the ballots filled in and he's putting them in the box himself. Now for the first time the Egyptian had evidence, solid evidence that the, their elections and their votes are being rigged. This is different than 
any reporter in any newspaper saying that he witnessed or that he saw or whatever but having video footage is important to prove it to the people that this is being done behind their backs we got dozens of these uh, videos some of them were close close-ups of from inside the polling stations Nobody's voting. It's only these guys putting the papers inside the box. And finally we received the graphic videos of torture inside police stations. This was unprecedented and we have never taken any footage like that during demonstrations. This, is, this took place in the one of the police stations in Port Said. And we kept receiving more footage. It didn't matter to them if it's a man or a woman. This is one of the techniques used widely in Egyptian police station. And we even received videos from other countries, like this footage of humiliation in Kuwait. Our campaign was successful and we managed to take one of the cases of the videos to the courts and it resulted in the conviction of the police officer responsible in this, in this footage is Islam Nabi and as you can see he is behind bars during the trial and of course I cannot, I cannot get enough of this footage of Islam Nabi behind bars this guy sodomized a microbus driver inside his police station and the guy was not charged of anything he was just bullying him he was just trying to prove that who is boss in this neighborhood but of course they tried to intimidate us this is a recording of one of the phone calls from the state security that I received. It's mostly insults in, um, in Arabic. It's so screechy. But I was getting loads of these phone calls. And campaigns to destroy our reputation this is the assistant of the minister of interior uh, in egypt who said that on this very popular talk show in egypt and this is mona shazli he said that i have a criminal past i have a criminal record and i had to respond to that by publishing my blank criminal record on my blog thank god for having our own blogs And my YouTube account was shut down. Until now, I don't know how He's it happened. He's an anti-torture watchdog who has documented abuses in his own country and posted them on YouTube for the whole world to see. But now he's offline. Our Middle East correspondent, Anish Rahman, has been looking into this. Parts of Anish's report may be disturbing. Wolf, one of Egypt's most prominent activists tonight says he has been silenced, not by his government, but by YouTube. It is cramped, cluttered, 
and for 33-year-old Wa'el Abbas, the perfect office. His is one of Egypt's best-known blogs, popular in large part because of frequent is being sodomized by police with a This stick. is the video of the sodomizing that I told video you about. on his blog, and overnight, Egypt was talking about police brutality. It's the first time the Egyptian people saw something like that. Until they saw that people are really in pain and agony and uh, being tortured and being beaten and being sodomized. And it was a shock to the Egyptian people. Down Wael's main avenue for challenging what he says This is the is victim in uh, the court abuse. and he's rejoicing after uh, he, we won the case against the officer. This, this is not really helping uh, people who are fighting for democracy in, in third world countries. Uh, we, we thought that YouTube was our ally. It, 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 helped, it helped show the truth in countries like Burma, but with what they did now, it, it doesn't seem like that anymore. A YouTube spokesperson tells us that while they don't comment on specific cases, repeated complaints about offensive videos do lead to some accounts being disabled. But for Wael, the fight is far from over. Wolf? Of course, it's offensive because it's torture and police brutality. And this is part of the treatment that I got in the airports leaving the country or coming back from outside. I get... Uh, almost strip searched as a drug dealer and they confiscate any electronic devices that I had. They conf confiscated my laptop, my CDs, my DVDs, my flash disks, my memory cards, any device that can carry data. And that's me on the left and these are customs officers going through my luggage. And one of the bloggers uh, shot this footage and uploaded it. But it wasn't only me, of course. Anybody who was doing the same got the same treatment or even worse. This is Ahmed Maher. Uh, he's the leader of the 6th of April movement. And uh, during a call for a general strike in Egypt in 2008, he was kidnapped from the street and he was tortured. For what? They wanted the password to his Facebook group that was calling for the, ge the general strike. He showed me the marks of torture on his body. That's what happened to his car while they were trying to stop him. And of course we cannot forget Karim Amr who suffered four years in jail for expressing his opinion on his blog. This is a live coverage of a press conference where he was talking after he was released. He was accused of insulting the president and insulting the religion of Islam and was sentenced to four years in jail. This is a live broadcast from the street in the early morning of the 25th of January. As you can see, it's a day off because it's a police day and no one could have imagined that this would be a historic day in Egyptian history. I'm driving towards Tahrir Square now from Talat Harb.
And as you can see, the streets are empty and the square is empty. Nothing looks like nothing is going to happen. But that's the night of the same day in Tahrir Square. You can see the police trucks and troops and they are shooting in the air and shooting tear gas too. They were surrounding the square from all the streets. All the entrances of the square were surrounded. This is a video of some of the arrests and beatings that took place uh, that day. All these soldiers are beating one, beating one guy. More arrests here. It's too dark, I guess. And then came the Friday of anger. This is the Azbakeya police station in downtown Cairo. It was set on fire and was looted after it was abandoned completely by the police who disappeared completely that day. And this is the building of the ruling party, the National Democratic Party. It's on the Nile Coronation Cairo. And this is a sit-in that took place later in Tahrir Square, demanding that Mubarak leaves. It was cold and it was rainy and people built tents to stay in from the cold. But it was the, the, the freest place in the country and the nicest atmosphere ever. Despite all the attacks from the thugs and from the police, This is the video of the aftermath of the clashes with the police near the Ministry of Interior, which, which was by the, that time completely neutralized. This is the closest we could get to the Ministry of Interior. We could not get any closer to the Ministry of Interior because of the snipers that were on the roof of the Ministry of Interior that they now claim that they never existed. All these are police cars and trucks and microbuses. This is a live broadcast from the field hospital in Tahrir Square. We had our field hospital, nursery, school, 
we had even a, a barber shop in Tahir Square. So we would feel independent from what, what's outside. Those people were injured during the clashes, either with the central security or with the thugs during the camel battle day. They were stopping the people who came with medical supplies and water and food to the square. And then came the army. As you can see the tank on the right side, and those people are praying. And we were all praying back then that the army would take our side, not Mubarak's side. And then came this crazy day when Mubarak decided to intimidate us with jet fighters. We never understood why did he do that. But there were sonic booms over our heads. These planes were flying very low over the Hay Square in order to maybe intimidate the people or intimidate the pedestrian uh, uh, military units that are in Tahrir if they decided to join the protest. And then Mubarak stepped down. And these are the celebrations outside the presidential palace in Heliopolis. And these are the celebrations later in Tahrir Square. People in Egypt never celebrated like that, even during football matches when we won uh, international tournaments. And then we stormed the headquarters of the state security and I was broadcasting live from inside this very fearful place uh, that is famous for torture and killing of the uh, activists. And these are documents carrying the secrets of the uh, police state and they have shredded it. But when we wanted to know more secrets and we headed to the headquarters in downtown we were stopped by the military police in cooperation with none other than the Suggs. The As you can see, they were shooting at us and driving us towards the thugs who are throwing stones at us. So we were in between a rock and a hard place, whatever they call it. It was, a, it was a very bad situation, uh, I almost died there. And then we had another similar situation for a peaceful protest that was going towards the Ministry of Defense in Abbasiyah, which is called Kamashat al-Abbasiyah, where we were surrounded by the military police on one side and the thugs who were throwing stones at us and also Molotov cocktails.
And of course you have heard about the massacre that took place in Maspiro a few days ago where Christian protesters peacefully were demanding their rights in front of the TV building and the military suddenly got crazy uh, about protecting the TV building which is the thing that is be really between us and fulfilling uh, our revolution. So this shows you uh, what we are facing at the moment and that uh, our revolution is far from over and that we still need to continue doing what uh, we have been doing since seven years or so. Uh, I guess that's it and uh, I'm open for questions if you uh, have any. Hi, hi, Wade. Um, uh, just to let everyone know, I'm, a, I'm a, an Egyptian as well. <laughs> and he's uh, a blogger too. He's a prominent one too. Tilmizek, you're a student. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned briefly at the end uh, that this is something everyone in Egypt regrets. Why is it on the 28th of January, the, day, uh, the, the Friday of anger, we burnt almost 100 uh, police stations and uh, we burnt the building of the NDP. Why did we not do the same? With the national, uh, with the TV and radio, television, because right now it's being used as a propaganda tool that is uh, using, taking all the Egyptians, many of the Egyptians, against the revolution, like we saw in Maspiro. So my question is, where do you see mainstream media, both public and satellite TV channels, which are supposed to be independent, where do you see them changing in the coming months, especially with the rise of blogging and uh, citizen journalism? Well, unfortunately, I don't see any progress because of the nature of these uh, uh, TV stations and uh, the circumstances sur surrounding their establishment because they are mostly owned by businessmen who are um, uh, in, in direct relation with the ruling party. Uh, and they always fear for their investment and their interests and the advertising on their channels, uh, so they, they cannot dare um, go against the, uh, whoever is ruling, whether it's Mubarak or it's the military council. And the military council has also imposed a lot, lots of uh, horrible regulations against uh, the media and against uh, the TV stations, uh, attacking them and confiscating tapes and shutting them down and preventing them from broadcasting live just like they did with uh, uh, Al Jazeera and uh, with uh, Al Hurra and uh, Channel 25. Um, and about the uh, burning of the TV building, uh, you, you won't believe it, but it was the first building that the army came to protect. The army tanks came to the hell, to, to the rescue of the uh, uh, Maspiro building. And there was already, uh, I think, a battalion of uh, the Presidential Guard protecting this, uh, this building. So we were not, ab we were not able to uh, take control of it back then, unfortunately. They, they, they know uh, the, the rules of the game and uh, they were ahead of us with, with one step, unfortunately. But it's never too late, who knows? Okay, we got another one here. Hello. Um, you started to fire for the revolution uh, in Egypt. So what happens now? How do you see your role in the changing Egypt? Uh, my role as a blogger and the role of other bloggers is to continue doing what we are doing, exposing torture and corruption. And uh, we are now facing military trials for activists and even for journalists. We have a blogger who is in jail now for three years for criticizing the military council after the revolution. Um, so we still have a long way uh, ahead of us until we get rid of this military control and 
start building a civil state with a healthy atmosphere for civil society and real political parties that represent the people and free media that nobody get interferes in their uh, editorial policy or what they cover or not cover. Hi, well, it's some kind of similar question to the last one. You told that you are looking for a democracy. Also, even here in Europe, there are people looking for real democracy. So I have a question, what is a real democracy? What, how is the democracy that you are looking for? And do you have any country in mind to look for any country as an example of the democracy that you are looking for? Thank you. Not really. I'm not uh, taking any country as an example because I know that all the countries, despite the freedoms they might have, it's not the complete democracy or, or not the utopia that we are dreaming of. Uh, for example, you have uh, in the United States, you have representation and local representation, but um, the people cannot vote on the decisions that the Congress is making, like going to war, for example. People don't decide on that. Uh, also, in a real democracy, I believe that you have a voice in the media, you have a voice in, in, in uh, the government and in the parliament. Uh, but in, in the free world, in, in the Western countries, the media is also controlled by businessmen and huge networks that have interests that might be also uh, the same as uh, whoever is, is running the country. And they are focusing mainly on an ent entertainment and they rarely discuss real uh, issues. Uh, and um, I, I, don't, I don't hear the, the average American or the average Spanish person or the average German uh, person on TV. I only hear politicians and uh, uh, musicians and movie stars and stuff like that. So this is, this is not really the, the real democracy that I'm, I'm aspiring for. I'm aspiring for something that really represents us, wh where, whether it is in the government or in the media. Hi, well, um, people on Twitter are, are asking you questions, so I figured I'd read you one. Um, Tim, t Tom Rizzo is saying, um, uh, what do you think about the role of YouTube and all of the tools like Facebook and Twitter moving forward? Uh, you spoke a little bit about it, but he wonders whether the revolution would have been possible at all without them. Uh, and then another question that came in is about the reports of, uh, in Maspero of the bodies being thrown in the Nile. If it's not rumors, which it started off looking like, and it's true, what do you think of that in terms of your personal opinion? Um, about the bodies being thrown in the Nile, we had reports from people who were there that they have seen soldiers throwing bodies on the Nile. And I don't know what happened afterwards because there was a curfew uh, later that night. I don't know if they picked the bodies or the bodies um, float uh, to the Delta or they will be picked up later. I don't know. I'm not really sure because it wasn't me behind this, but it was people who were there in, in, in the action. And the first question? Ah, um, some, a lot of people say that it's a Facebook revolution or it's a Twitter revolution, or, but um, I'm not one of these and I don't like to overestimate the role that the social media has played in the revolution because after all, it's the decision of the people to revolt. And I'm, I don't also um, uh, want to take all the credit away from the social media because the social media has helped us organize convey our message, campaign for it, uh, get help, um, get supplies when we needed them in the square, for example. Uh, made things happen faster in, 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 in a very organized fashion. Uh, if we did not have these social media applications, uh, I think it could have taken us longer uh, to, um, to do this revolution. But as long as th there is a will, a uh, revolution will happen, and it happened in, in other places, like in Eastern Europe, for example, and some countries in South America, and they did not have social media. So it's the will of the people that comes first. Hi, Oel. Thank you for the talk. Um, a few minutes ago, you said that satellite channels and state TV are usually controlled by the interests of businessmen who own them. And so my question has two parts. Do you think that what one 
reason of the success of many of the revolutions in the region is the government's incompetence in utilizing social media. And another form of the question is, would this change by time? Would governments learn to use social media to counter how people are using them to mobilize people and to ignite revolutions? Would it be possible to end up with social media just as we are now with satellite and TVs? Thank you. They have been doing stuff like that since ages, like in China, the Great Firewall in China, and in countries like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates where all the website with political content is blocked, and in Iran and in Syria and Libya. Uh, but blocking the internet did not prevent things from happening, like in Egypt, like in Libya, like in Syria. Even during the time when the internet was cut off Egypt, we were in the square and we were communicating with each other. We f found other means of communication, uh, such as messengers on motorcycles, for example, or using the ground phone lines. Uh, they are trying to use the, the social media also, uh, but their use is now limited to um, smear campaigns against bloggers and activists, like this blogger is an atheist, this blogger is a homosexual, this blogger is so and so. <coughs> but their, their, their followership is not that uh, serious and it's not that active and it's not that danger yet. Uh, I hope it, it, it doesn't evolve into something uh, dangerous, but until this moment we still have the upper hand. What we don't have the upper hand on is the state TV. This is our real problem at the moment. Okay. Down here. Hi, I'm Frederick. Um, yeah, well, I want to know what, what is your vision for the ideal political system for Egypt um, for the next five to ten years? Like, um, and that's the first part of the question. Second part, what do you predict would happen um, within the next five to ten years? Like, uh, uh, is, it, is it going to be like, a, like an Islamic, towards an Islamic state? Is it going to be like a hybrid system? Is it going to be like a copy of a European <coughs> um, a political system or something like that? Yeah, basically. Um, I cannot predict the future, but I... I, I, I what I can do is to work on making it better, uh, me and the other activists and bloggers. This is what is needed at the moment, is to work on something. I don't have a, uh, a political ideology that I uh, believe in, uh, so I'm not advocating for the left or the right or the Islamist or whatever, but what I believe in is that we should have a system where the president has limited powers and more powers to be given to the parliament and where the government is not central in Egypt. Uh, we used to have uh, the Minister of Health, for example, or the Minister of Education. Uh, before he takes decisions, he asks the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister in his uh, turn asks the President on what to do on a certain issue, and then uh, the issue is never solved until there is a um, uh, com comment from the President saying that, okay, we have found a solution to this problem, and it is so and so, and the, the media will would hail him, and we don't, do that, we don't want that to happen anymore. Uh, also, uh, I believe in building a, a civil state on three pillars. Uh, as I mentioned before, free media, media that is not controlled or censored uh, by anybody, and that is watched also, uh, and a free civil society, the, the right to form organization and, and NGOs, uh, without permission from the security or the government and also building real political parties that represent the needs of the people. Uh, so if some people are uh, leftists, let them form a party or... Because what we had in the past was uh, cartoon political parties that were there only to decorate or make the regime look better in the, uh, in the eyes of the West. Um, so we don't want that anymore. We want parties to start from the ground, not from above by permission. Uh, this is the, 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 the country that, that I believe that we need to work on building. And if the Islamists came to power, uh, what I will work against is that they throw down the ladder so that nobody else can climb 
on top. Uh, as long as they are going to be um, there for the, the term that they were elected for and uh, not try to change the constitution or to change the laws or to stay there forever, uh, they are most welcome and I'm, I'm sure that uh, they, their um, work will be disappointing to the people and they will never uh, choose them again. That's what I believe in. This is the last question, quick. Uh, hi. Then what do you think about the recent parties of your country at the moment, uh, their programs and uh, their uh, perspective? Are they going to be succeeding in the future? I mean, in recent times, what are they doing? We have a completely unhealthy atmosphere in Egypt at the moment. So I really am not concerned about the political parties or about the elections. I'm really concerned about the military council and that it should leave. The, uh, we have a, a constitutional declaration that puts all the powers in the hand of the military council. Uh, we have uh, political parties law that uh, was imposed by the military council. Uh, we have election law that was imposed by the military council. Uh, Egyptians abroad, they don't have the right to vote. Uh, no judicial monitoring of the election and no international monitoring of the elections. And the military council is going after the NGO and their sources of funding. And we have recently had the Minister of Justice saying that the NGOs that are receiving funds from abroad are committing acts of treason. So this is what we are facing at the moment. So we, I don't believe in playing the game with them the way that they want, with the rules that they have imposed on me. I want to play a fair game. And the next elections are not going to be fair, in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Wael. I think that's all. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you to the people following us online. Please stay tuned on the next coming sessions. There's a lot of issues on, on social and uh, stuff, and uh, I think uh, you, you like it. And uh, feel free to network uh, with Wael. He'll be here for a while.